Welcome to day two of Series Scripts, and we're very happy that all of you made it at 11 a.m. on a Saturday morning. So thank you for spending your weekend with us so early. Uh, welcome to our first session, which is an author conversation with uh, Saharuna Seba Kananari on his book Chronicles of an Hour and a Half, and he'll be in conversation with uh, Shabanti Bakchi. The book details the story of a village in the Western Ghats where a rumor of an illicit affair goes out of hand. Uh, before we begin, just a few things. Uh, may I just request you to move up in front so that people who come a little bit later can sit behind. Uh, please also put your phones on silent. Uh, we'll also be taking questions towards the end, so just please wait for the mic to be handed to you before you ask your questions. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this morning. Uh, Saharu lives in a small town called Arikori near Calicut. I hope I got that right. And Chronicle of an Hour and a Half is his first novel. Shabati Vakchi is National Features Editor at Mint, writing primarily for its weekend publication, Mint Lounge, a magazine of art, culture, and lifestyle. Thank you so much for being here. And Shabanti, over to you. Hello. Is this working, the mic? OK, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for coming here like uh, nice and early on a Saturday. Um, so happy to be talking to you, Saharu. And um, so, you know, I, I read Saharu's book. Uh, I would have read it anyway, but, you know, this session kind of gave me an added impetus to read because uh, there has been so much talk about the book. It has been hailed as one of the most promising and, and outstanding debuts uh, of this past one year or so. And uh, I'll just read a little bit about the book. In fact, this is uh, from Scroll, from Scroll's interview that they did. I thought, you know, the uh, introduction had a very good description of what the book is about. Um, so, Saharu Nusaiba Kananari's uh, debut novel, Chronicle of an Hour and a Half, imagines the worst of mob culture, moral policing, and misogyny. Set in Arikot, Kerala, which is also where the author lives, a rumor of an illicit affair takes on a life of its own, fueled by feverish, relentless WhatsApp messages. As chaos ensues, the small town erupts into violence, and a mob takes to the street, baying for blood. Kananari employs the voices of a dozen or so characters to tell the story of how loose tongues, callous gossiping, and brute machismo can prove deadly even for two adults engaged in a consensual relationship. The novel forces us to consider how mobs are made and what entices regular people to turn murderers. So that's how uh, some of the reviewers, some of the people who've interviewed you describe the book. Uh, how would you describe the book, Saharu? Well, I mean, that's a difficult question. <laughs> um, well, it's, 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 um, I'll just tell you, I will just repeat. Uh, firstly, I, I don't assume that you have a familiarity with the book. And um, um, still, I would try to be useful somehow. <laughs> I, so um, let me give you a process of what the book is about. The book is about, uh, um, how do you say it? <laughs> it's the career. It's, uh, this is what I've been saying. Um, I, I like this um, sentence. It basically narrates the career of a lie about a mother being slapped and the outbreak of a news of an extramarital affair on WhatsApp. Um, both these two events uh, trigger a mob and uh, things happen. This is the, the, the synopsis in one, two sentences of what the novel is about. The novel is also written using um, multiple narrators, so that there is 15 or 16 narrators describing the event. And these people belong to the village, these people belong to the families in question, or relatives of the families involved in um, uh, the extramarital affair. Um, etc. So it's a multi-voice narration and um, it um, is a short novel and it um, um, studies the... I believe that Malayalis, I always have found out that Malayalis live under generally India but maybe a bit acutely I register it because I live in Kerala. Malayalis live under this perpetual fear that you know somebody other than me is having sex. And um, I wanted to understand the consequences of that, uh, that insecurity. 
Um, and this, this novel is about um, an extramarital affair which goes live um, in the age of WhatsApp. And what are its consequences and what does it tell about human nature and the, the, the how, why violence is triggered. Uh, does this violence that is triggered um, owe a strong explanation, in, um, uh, uh, profound explanation in human psyche? Or are these casual violence masquerading, uh, you know, as profound? So this this is the novel is about. So far as I don't know, people say different things about what you have written. I don't I don't have a <laughs> strong comment on uh, scroll. Yeah, this is the novel is about. Yes. She is right. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, I just found that description uh, very precise, and you know, uh, and after having read the book, I realized that yeah, it kind of you know. Yeah. It's together the gist of what it's about. So, but tell me something, like when you, where did the story come from? Like did it come sort of fully formed into your head? Was it like a spark of an idea from a news event or something that happened in real life? And how did that story develop and take the, its current shape? Well, I, I have been writing for a very long time. I, I don't, I don't, I don't access my the origins of any novel in the in the way other people uh, are able to articulate it. Um, I also don't think that I'm uh, I'm very inspired by um, anything at all. And uh, I live largely, I think, mostly. Even though people exaggerate that, you know, you should um, talk to people, you should travel, and you discover. Uh, life in the world, and then come back to your room and write it. I actually haven't traveled out of Kerala except to study in JNU. And even in JNU, I haven't seen much outside JNU. So life experience is, uh, it's not important in me. Um, largely, my understanding about human nature is derived from the books that I have read. And, um, and uh, this novel also must have been a result of, you know, um, uh, my desire to become a writer. And on the other hand, it also might also betray my education because uh, I, I have been reading, um, immersing myself in literature uh, at least since my MA. And my friend Sushmita is here, and they would all know me as someone who just speaks literature and uh, never reads anything um, on political science, which is what my PG was on in JNU. Um, so. Uh, on the other hand, um, I would mention that in 2011, I had mentioned it somewhere. Uh, I don't know where, but in 2011 there was an incident um, in Calicut, which is the district nearest to my district is Malappuram. Um, so in Calicut district there was an incident where uh, um, um, a man uh, was lynched by a mob. This guy died three days later. Um, right, this is mentioned in the book, right? Mukkam. Uh, the Maybe a, a sentence the, here. A the Mukkam incident. Mukkam that incident. Is, yeah, Somebody yeah, mentions yeah, that there's yeah, yeah. Been a But the details incident. of that Mukkam incident again is made up. I mean, right. I, I'm, I'm make, making up those details. Right. I don't know actually about the, what exactly that event was because it was in 2011. But somewhere it triggered a sort of a, uh, you know, like a narrative. No, no. What the, I, I'll tell you exactly what, uh, not exactly, but. And uh, there's a, I'm um, very well uh, read in Faulkner, for example. Right. And um, there's this book called As I Lay Dying. And um, I read it and there's a character called Addy Brunden. And Addy Brunden, I read that, uh, it's a short chapter, four or five pages, and I read that some 500,000 times. Because I do have, a, I'm a very obsessive reader. I don't read widely, as widely as people uh, generally do. I read a certain books, and if I like that, I keep rereading that until I know that you know it, the story matures in me. Um, so I think that uh, the initial reaction uh, when, I, when I was uh, writing this novel, maybe, and I do not know very clearly, but maybe that initial uh, energy uh, was unleashed by my uh, deep reading of R.D. Brunton's monologue. Uh, four or five pages long monologue in As I Lay Dying. This is the mother figure. And uh, that, ref that is also reflected, I believe, in the mother uh, character in that the novel so itself, mm. in a very Indian context. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm not very triggered by uh, things that is happening around me. I would have come up with anyway. I mean, it's not very difficult to imagine, you know, a mob triggered by an extramarital affair live. Um, in Kerala. It's not a very, very uh, difficult thing to come up with. 
Right, because uh, this was a question I had for later, but it has all be, it, it intrigued me as I was reading this that you have made commentary. I mean, you know, in the book there is certain characters do talk about how you know the urban migration, especially in the in Kerala, as we know, like so many men, you know, who go abroad to work, go to the Gulf to work, and has created this generation of like families which are separate and you know so in some sense there is sex yeah i mean you know the marriages which are kind of um, extremely differently i mean you know they they don't have they don't live together so it leaves these people so these are certain observations that also yeah yeah and these are not again i mean they, they, you do not have to have a very um, strong observational quality in order to get at these things. So largely, anything that I write, not only this, anything that I write largely are zooming on um, uh, stereotypes. So this is a stereotype about uh, Malapuram district, uh, where, you know, 65% of the population is Muslim. And uh, there is a stereotype, which I hear from very early in my life, that, you know, uh, women are up to sex. Uh, right. Because their husbands are not around, and the events also like uh, some, somebody in nearby my house knocked on somebody's door, that woman screamed, and all of us came out and discovered that somebody you know ran away, thinking that you know now we know that you know this person wanted to have sex with her, this person um, uh, husband was uh, uh, in the Gulf. These stories keep happening in daily life. Oh, yeah. There are a lot of anxieties around, you know, women who are kind of single and not really There single. is concerns for them. That yeah, yeah, they are so much, sexless and they because, want to... Yeah, because, you know, <laughs> and uh, clearly they cannot have any desires of their own, so... Yeah, but these are occasions to, uh, you know, uh, push our larger narrative, which is, you know, I wanted to bring the village alive. And I wanted to bring the village alive uh, through its most commonest uh, stereotypical anxiety. Because stereotypes um, are, is a good opportunity, in my opinion, to explore a society. Its reactions and, you know, reactions to that uh, stereotype actually taking place. Um, so all my novels are basically study on stereotypes, <laughs> to put it like that. <laughs> No, but these are the kind of, you know, the overwhelming anxiety that tell us so much about what's going on beneath the surface, right? Initially, I wanted to people an impulse, a mob lynching, and I wanted not to do that through the perpetrator, uh, victim, because a victim, the moment you uh, pay attention so much attention to the victim, the narrative tends to uh, get sentimental right. and uh, correct. Um, and I wanted uh, none of the victims in any time, at, and in, in any novel that I write, I never look at the victim as a victim uh, to whom we have all have to come together and sympathize, but rather as someone who may in fact be an agent of uh, some other problems. Or, you know, in this particular novel, Burhan himself might have been uh, one of those people who had uh, murdered him, had it been, you know, some other woman in the neighborhood who was uh, found out to be having an affair with somebody else. Yes, and there is a point in the novel where uh, Burhan mentions that his cousin uh, was yes, having yes. an affair with uh, some other guy and he went and roughed him up. Yes. And so Burhan is a character who is kind of... Okay, I don't think there are any spoilers here because, you know, it's a very straightforward... In the Bur sense, Burhan is the character who is having an affair with um, an older woman. Burhan is 25-year-old and uh, the lady in question is 40-year-old. And uh, this is the context for the novel. And um, I exaggerate that age difference uh, in order to, you know, um, get into this, get uh, access to that uh, proper anxiety. What exactly does it make a difference that this woman is older and this man is younger? Um, so this gave me an opportunity to, to exaggerate motive. And Don Delillo once said that, you know, literature works through only exaggeration. You have to exaggerate the motive. Because human life is very, very slow, simple, um, that, you know, and on the surface, that it, you know, unless you crowd a, you know, um, a very momentous event upon it, it may not actually work. Uh, uh, not deliver the drama. Deliver that the drama that literature uh, is striving for. <laughs> so you have to exaggerate motive, and I have exaggerated. Uh, I don't even know the word is exaggeration, but it's very difficult to capture uh, human behavior in uh, so many few pages. 
No, I also noticed that even the age difference gets, you know, because it's all Chinese whispers, right? So, like, some people are saying they had a 15-year age difference. Then somehow it gets conflated to, like, you know, oh, she's almost 50 and he's... So, you know, and that plays a, a thing in people's minds where, you know, they just cannot accept it. So, all these sort of social anxieties and fears of, like, people around sexuality especially, like, really, really come out in, in this whole drama. Basically. So, Sahiru, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, the novel has around almost 15, 16 narrators. So, it's, uh, think of it like, like you know, like Game of Thrones, if you've read. So, each chapter is told from another, uh, somebody's point of view. So, I mean, I'm not saying this. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying that. Think of it as, so every, but at the same time, there is a Roshaman like quality also over here because there are certain incidents that happen that everybody, you know, sees from a different angle. So that is something that, you know, uh, Sahru has done very masterfully in the book. Like having so many narrators, they are all narrating a small piece of the incident as seen from their eyes. But it must have been difficult as an author to keep so many narrative voices like in your head and on the paper. Well, people say so. <laughs> but you didn't uh, find it difficult. I don't find writing difficult. I find it very easy. It's just about sitting down and writing. Um, also, um, I don't, I don't, I don't. Um, um, uh, McCarthy, Cormac McCarthy, you know, he read, doesn't give interviews, but once he said that, you know, a lot of people talk about writing as if they were chewing a burden. Um, I'm not chewing a burden. I'm doing um, very well. It's just about getting up, and I have been getting up very regularly for all these years. I wake up early, and I do my six to eight hours or ten hours every day. Writing, I don't find difficult. It's just about, uh, I largely have to pay attention to, you know, the sentence construction, which is where a lot of my energy is spent on. Um, I do uh, have a lot of rules. Uh, Ajita is sitting there. <laughs> she is my editor. Uh, she edited the book at the Westland. Um, yeah, so even on editorial table, largely our conversation is not about anything thematic. It's largely about the adverb either kyun dal diya tumne ye hata do ye sab hota hai so that's largely i, I think one, uh, uh, a strong dependence on adverb is um, you know a, a knowledge of the lack of proper verb and um, and stuff like that, yeah. I mean, I don't use it's more the technical aspects of like writing and writing in English that maybe you know, uh, both I mean, is more challenging rather than the plot dynamics. So, you're saying that no, what I was asking is, I mean, how did you it was easy for you to sort of you know see what all these 16 characters are seeing and then describe it on the page? Did you have a flow chart or like? <laughs> this is again um, uh, the problem with a lot of these questions, not the question themselves, but. A lot of it mistake uh, the process of writing for something um, that you are, you know, you can tell apart a day from another. It's not really possible that it's my life is so so similar uh, that, that it's very difficult to tell apart a day from another. That you know, I just sit down and write. So the processes that went at the time, I would tell you clearly what exactly was my mind. My mind was that I had written three novels and none of it got published. <laughs> so now <laughs> and, let me write one. <laughs> and I wanted to write something short. Um, and I came up with this. I don't know why, how. These are very fancy questions or, you know, very questions that somehow, you know, would allow me to intellectualize the whole process. But I don't want to be part of that esoterization. I think. I this understand is, what you're saying. Yeah. Writers themselves have made writing so esoteric that you know a lot of people are afraid to do something uh, like you know sitting down and uh, writing a novel. Um, Faulkner was once asked, you know, did he, you did you write every day? Do you uh, no? He was asked, you know, um, uh, you wrote only when you are inspired. Inspiration. It's a big word. I mean, everybody says it. And uh, Faulkner said something which I understood fully that, you know, he said that I write only when I'm inspired, but I'm inspired every day from 9 o'clock to 5 p.m. Oh, amazing. Uh, yeah. I think I should print that out and put it on my wall so that I am also, <laughs> like, find it easier. It's like, you know, you write a novel. Now, I, I read books. I, I don't read widely, but I do still read. Um, um, so, when I'm finishing a book, I had finished a book, I can actually, you know, go through my mind and come up with, you know, suitable epigraphs for that novel. But 
it's not from the novel that I have gone, it's not from the epigraphs that I have, you know, went on to, gone on to write the novel. It's, it's not inspired by anything. It's inspired by the need to write itself. Because the need to write is, you know, so much more, so much more of an addiction and, and so much more a factor um, in writing anything, not only fiction, but anything, that, you know, we tend to exaggerate other motives in order to esotericize the whole process. I don't think writers are doing a great job at it, and good writers don't often esotericize the process. You just have to sit down and write. So, uh, if you ask me the mother characters, I can say that, you know, I came across a sentence by um, 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 Rebecca West, where she says that, you know, motherhood is its own Trojan horse. <laughs> now, uh, uh, Trojan horse, you know, the, yeah, yeah, horse, yeah the yeah. Troy horse, so that I, I can say that, you know, I was inspired by this sentence, but am I inspired by this sentence? No. There are many, way too many sentences to be inspired by. If you are hunting for inspiration, uh, you would be confused what to be inspired by. A single book has, you know, hundreds of sentences that, you know, you can be inspired, choose to be inspired by anything. Inspiration is a very useless word. It's, it's non-existent. What is inspiration? I don't know this word. It's like, it's like the word political. People say, you know, this is political. What is political? What exactly makes something political? Arundhati Roy said that, you know, even the money that goes into the research of a squid sex life is political. Now, I understand that uh, she is making a larger point, but it also somehow relieves me, you know, because I don't have, now I don't have to try to be political specifically because everything is everything political. Is political. Everything so is it's a very loose word, this inspiration, uh, political, etc. You, the moment you begin to pay attention to these words, you begin to take yourself very seriously in a non-writerly way, and you don't want to play into that uh, because inspiration kitna ho jayega. Matlab, you write one novel out of inspiration, you will you st uh, end up. Uh, you you have to keep writing. Yeah, I mean, you know what you're saying. You're <laughs> saying that it's not like you know everybody has this burning story inside them that they have to tell. You're saying it's it's more of the compulsion to tell stories, to tell any story, to write itself that, that comes, that you know, that your book As a writer, out you have to write, you, you might end up writing 15, 20 novels. How do you get 15, 20 inspiration? Yes. Vaise, I cannot, because I am sitting at, my, largely my mother sees me, I see my mother. These are the only two interactions that I have in my daily life. What inspiration? Well, there is no inspiration. It's just, it's just my mother, kya hai? Tumko chai chai hai, main chai chai hai. <laughs> Uh, book lag raha hai, book lag but you're making it sound <laughs> as if writing is like a similar job as say, I find writing I very easy. Know. I envy you, Saharu, like deeply, deeply envy yes. you. But I mean, what I'm, I mean, you're making it sound, but and maybe it is that easy to you as like a mechanical job of like you know putting. I have anxiety once I finish writing, so I would be very anxious if uh, what, what would Ajita say, for example. Right. I mean, there's a smart reader who comes along, and what would this smart reader tell about my work? This anxiety, after finishing and after submitting, I do experience, and I'm, I'm very curious. But if they say that, you know, this is bullshit, uh, I may not actually be, you know, turned, bound, turned down by that. I would take that opinion very seriously, I would go back and read it, and if I'm convinced, I would accept that this is bullshit. If it isn't bullshit, then I would go and submit. I would have gone believing in my work. So, you do experience certain amount of anxiety, but it's not that writing is easy. It's rather that, you know, the word inspiration doesn't tell uh, what exactly is it. Doesn't convey the... Everydayness of the process. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, Saharu's book is also, uh, you know, the language of it is, is it feels very real, very earthy, very, you know, although, you know, obviously these people are talking in Malayalam and not in English, but uh, there is a certain process that happens there where you kind of, so how do you imagine the dialogue, say, or the narrative? Is it, do you... Because Heru has uh, said that, you know, he didn't uh, study English growing up. He kind of taught himself English, uh, you know, when he was in college and, and older. So how does that, pro that process happen? These are, we are talking about the nuts and bolts of writing, which you enjoy. So... Um, I do not know. I, I, learned, I, I learned the language uh, through text only. I largely don't speak, I don't speak in English to anybody. I met Sushmita. 
I'm, uh, she's one of my closest friends. Um, this is one person I can talk in English, but I, I met her after some four or five years. Um, I don't actually speak in English to anybody. And even, even uh, when, when uh, the book was published and I had to, they said that I had to go and talk, I was a bit curious, ki, how would I talk? Because I only talk to friends in a very casual way. How would I, would I process a thought in English? But then I realized that, you know, for writing for so long, I'm accustomed to thinking in English more than in Malayalam, especially literature. So far as the writing itself is concerned, I think um, uh, influence is a big process. Um, Virginia Woolf said that, you know, you, you, the best way to uh, read a book is, you know, as though you were writing it. Um, 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 uh, Nabokov said that, you know, uh, what did he say? He said that uh, um, the pleasure of reading corresponds to, you know, the pleasure of writing. Um, um, then there is, oh, oh, the, yeah, Yudera Welty said that, you know, um, what did she say? She said that, you know, every writer assumes, you know, in the reader an, enlight an enlightenment that equals his own or her own, the author's own. Um, so the best way, to, with language, I think largely it has to be the result of a cocktail of authors that I've been obsessing over for many years. And I've been obsessing over the same years for many years. I don't, as I said again, you know, I don't read for the sake of reading. I don't, I don't, a lot of the time I discover that, you know, a lot of the popular authors who are around, who are widely read, who are booker winners, I don't even know properly who these people are. So I, I discover often, you know, ye padeo. Actually, I haven't. Somebody said that, you know, Bernadine Everett, uh, Everest, uh, she, she, I kept saying he, he, and she, it's not he, it's she. I said, okay, I'll go and read her now. But um, this, is, this is true. I mean, I, I, I don't read widely. Well, that again is, you know, um, so I can recall, uh, um, uh, I used to remember, for example, Song of Myself, uh, Complete, uh, uh, Whitman's. So how do, I, how do I remember it? Because I'm reading and reading and reading and over reading, not to by heart itself. Uh, but yeah, so I can, I can, you know, uh, for example, um, the end section of a song of myself, you know, after so many pages, he says that, no, you will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be of good health to you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood, failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged, missing me one place, search another, I stop somewhere waiting for you. Um, this is the culmination of the final two stanzas of that uh, great poem. Now. You, you, if you read that, uh, you, you, essentially, you know, when you're walking, you are taking a walk, this, this comes back to you, this poem. You, you know, I stop somewhere waiting for you. I always thought my mother sto always stopped somewhere waiting for me. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, and also talking about your, uh, you know, the, the mother character in this, I love how you've been able to sort of, uh, you know, Nabisa, Nabisama, Nabisama, uh, Nabi and Rehana, the woman who is involved in this extramarital affair, which forms the crux of the story. So these two are very powerful women's voices, and I love how you have imagined uh, their experiences, which are not very typical. Like Nabisama has five sons, and uh, they are pretty useless, and you know she has a lot of anger against them and resentment against them, which is not a very typical Indian motherly sort of experience or you know emotion. So, uh, you know, how did you how did you sort of imagine that? And the, 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 it's a question of authenticity. There's a word. It's it's a, it's the most famous word now in in, in conversations. Authenticity, kya hai tumara? Um, th this is a very very um, I don't know if it's weird, but it's stra certainly strike me as strange because if, I, if I'm reading uh, Virginia Woolf, um, I, I look at her male characters you know, as, you know, profound as any uh, uh, great male writer. And if I write, uh, I was telling that, you know, uh, Virginia Woolf thought that, you know, um, Molly Bloom in Ulysses was a, you know, one of the greatest uh, female characters. And um, uh, now she, she's deeply aware that it's written by a male. Um, so, 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 uh, so to speak of caste, so to speak of skin color, the so to speak of race, etc. Um, the 
female character, that authenticity largely must have. So the sense of authenticity that, that, that you represented this character well, if somebody tells that to me. I take that to mean that, you know, what the technique that I've employed to, 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 to uh, get at these characters the way I want to get at them uh, succeeded. And which was that, make these characters speak raw. That uh, in life there is a fiction. In life we live in an agreed life. We know that what to speak, what not to speak, what hurts, what not to hurt. And even if somebody, something is, has to be said across, we so, say it across in such a way that uh, the listener is not hurt. So there is an agreement on the surface. And literature, in my opinion, has to you know, uh, break that agreement. So the only way we can achieve that is to uh, we achieve is by making people speak what they are not speaking in the real life. So Nabi Zuma talks about her sex life, Nabi Zuma talks about her um, unfinished uh, uh, life. Uh, 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 as a young woman, she was married off. She had to take care of the whole family. Now, what does it mean? It, me it meant exactly what she says, that her life is lived for uh, other people. A life has been lived for other people. And when I, then I ask, I, I go around, I uh, see uh, mothers in my neighborhood, and I understand that all these lives are lived for the children and husband. So it's not very difficult to understand uh, uh, the lives uh, that uh, you know, another gender or another caste lives. In fact, uh, the, you judge somebody to be a patriarchal man, um, based on the assumption, based on the conviction actually, that this person know exactly the wrong he is doing. And that awareness is what calls for such judgment, that this uh, man is deeply patriarchal, misogynist. So we, when we characterize somebody as a misogynist, we also extend an agency to that person which he is undermining uh, in order to you know, uh, get at what he wants to get at in a particular way. So you're saying that they themselves are not aware of... People are aware. They are aware. Yeah, this is exactly what makes a judgment possible, that you are aware of exactly what you're doing. There may be factors which might uh, mitigate your capacity to act in a certain way, uh, but in itself, that doesn't cancel it completely. Um, yeah, th this is what I think. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't take to be a Muslim to, to understand in India today, you know, what, what Muslims are experiencing. Uh, it doesn't take a Jew to understand what exactly Jews underwent in um, 1930s and 40s, or, you know, ever since Constantine's conversion in uh, 325, 15. So, um, this, this constant debate about how much we can exp understand another person's experience, or other caste experience is eventually, you know, also the same question as how much I understand you as a person. If, 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 even if you are relieved of all caste, gender, uh, all these uh, roles, still, how much we can know another person? My conviction is that um, um, any human beings communicate in language, and any animal which communicates in language necessarily tells lies and lies make our realities possible. Literature has to access truth, and in order to access truth, literature has to speak about what we are not speaking about. And that exactly lends it legitimacy is what I think, because Nabi Suman and Rehan are speaking very raw, and that rawness in itself is the, is the, is the, release, they are, uh, the release that I wanted. Uh, so all these characters, somebody was asking me, your characters are emotionally overcharged in this particular novel. I, 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 I believe that you know this was a reference to Nabi Suman Rehana, two uh, central characters in the novel. And my understanding is that this uh, this is um, deliberately done. And why? Because I wanted these two characters to speak in a once in a lifetime outrage. And that outrage, uh, when we are not negotiating that through, you know, um, a very uh, neutralized kind of language, when we are allowing these women to speak as raw as they are speaking about the fact and fiction, about their lives, I think they become authentic. Um, we are not telling the truth, mostly. We are bombing. Most of the time we are... <laughs> Most of the time we are move se jo back pain relief karta hai na, aise karte hai. We need to dissect it properly. 
And I think um, uh, when, when I write, I believe that most of us are not doing it. And, uh, and uh, uh, th th there could be an appeal in doing it. Because yeah, and what I loved is, uh, you know, without using those so many words, uh, in very subtly, you also make clear Nabi Summa's anger and resentment at her sons, and at the same time, her deep anxieties for them, and she kind of resents herself for loving them and being, you know, worried about Burhan because he is in this perilous situation, and at the same time, she, you know, has the, so th this whole emotional landscape is extremely complex, is what I'm trying to say, I think. So, uh, Zaru, uh, would you like to read a little bit from the book? I can. I have been reading this for quite a while now. <laughs> okay, this is, this is again from the mother character, the mother of uh, the one who is having an affair with uh, the older woman. Um, so, she's talking about her life, and I'll read for five Five to five, five, ten minutes? I don't know. Yeah, I'll read some on and off two pages. Be patient with me. Um, so her name is Nebisuma. They married me off across the river on a bright summer day in late May 1986. The water used to be much cleaner then, and on a clear 14th night you could see the flawless dunes of white sand and little shadows of orange chromates and garfish and schools of Jan Danios as they swam, dimpling the surface in their trail. In deep summer, the river used to shrink, bearing the undulant sand dunes. As evening approached, they filled up, filled up with picnickers and spotters and hawkers. Kids ran with paper kites or trace iron fillings in the sands with bits of magnet wrapped in bits of paper. At dusk, just as the calls for Maghrib prayers rose from all the mosques in and around the town and from the villages beyond the river, a thousand bats took flight from the dense palms along the banks in waves against the late colors of the sun. It was at this time of the year that the nomads with their obscure tongues and acrobatic children used to put up their canvas tents on the sands and set up their great circus, and the nights were great fun. Then my parents married me off. They came to my home on a boat, the groom and his aunties and his uncles and the, and the men from the village, and I went with them down the stairs into the river, across the river on the same boat that brought them, and truck four kilometers up the trails towards his home under the harsh blue sky and the white glaring sun, through coconut hills and paddy fields and sesame fields and granite quarries and cashew orchards with their pungent root fruits canopies of teaks with meandering trails flanked by wild pineapples rudder than red roses, and streams with boulders as old as the earth, with water as clear as glass, infested with water spiders and trout still and pensive as hermits, black as rocks. Even then I was confused, walking with my groom who wore a white mundu and white polyester shirt with a plated handkerchief tucked under its collar, fairer, older, a good two feet taller, yet somehow slower than me. Even then I was confused about this strange man, my life to come, the responsibility of having to give birth to children soon and the liability of having to love them more than myself because I was merely 19 and I wasn't finished loving myself enough. I married him because he was 14 years older than me and that single factor slashed the dowry by more than half and that was not a deal my father could have rejected even though my husband had no job. He got so late to marry because he was so lazy to marry. When my father asked him about his job, he said he would look for one with a kind of bird and assurance. My father agreed. My father agreed because I had four younger sisters waiting for their turn with all their burden of dowries and brown skin. And then I was pregnant each year, a ritual much like Ramzan. And each child, was, and each child was like a bomb, an explosion of confusion. I didn't even know that I had any part in it. The children were just coming out of me despite myself, as if my body was growing new limbs without my own consent. And by the time I was aware, the house was full of their hungry noise, like a few eternally whistling pressure cookers and I lay sleeplessly beside my husband who couldn't get it upon the bed. Not anymore. At first I refused to accept that I was their mother, that they were my children. I pretended that they were the children of a dead brother I never had. 
but they grow on you, children. And even though at first they were the limbs I never wanted, they soon became the limbs I couldn't cut off. And slowly I began to love them, slowly, confusedly, with a kind of helpless indifference. I could feel the ache of Ibrahim's milk teeth on my nipples long after I had stopped suckling him and somehow I grew maternal without my own consent. In the quiet middle of the night, I would be suckling two at a time while the other three went on crying and I felt like a helpless bitch with a limited number of others and for a long time I didn't sleep. During day, I opened ports of kapok and stuffed the mattresses with their fluffy fiber at the communist mattress company across the river. And at night, I pedaled the sewing machine, dream, 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 while the children clung like bats to my breasts and for a long time I didn't sleep. I don't remember when I finally fell asleep, but by the time I woke up, I had already become an old woman. My hair was gray, messy, tangled, as though overnight seasons had moved right under my scalp in some dizzying spell. And in the mirror, I looked like a mad hurricane or a sorceress waking from some frightful trance. My knees were arthritic, my vision dim and hearing dull. Memories seemed to have fled and some kind of a night had endeared my eyes and mine and they were all no more than some dependent shadows. In my husband I saw my sons old and in my sons I saw my husband young, each to the other synonymous, handsome, muscular, cranky, ungrateful, useless. Yeah, reading about those boys made me really angry because, you know, I was like, why the hell aren't they doing something? Like, how can men be so blind as to not see that, you know, their old mother is just working herself to the bone and they are just waltzing around? Is that common? Like... If it's common if you also see it a lot of cases such, such as that. I don't know if it's common. <laughs> It's this. Well, this is again. Um, Nabokov once said that you know in his lecture on um, on um, in his introduction to uh, liter uh, lectures on um, Joyce, uh, Ulysses, um, uh, Jane Austen, etc. That introduction he said that the creation of a novel invents in, invents its own world. It has no correspondence, almost no correspondence to reality, which is why he said he calls them fairy tales. And he says that all those who go looking for, uh, you know, great memory of Joyce who was sitting in Paris while he was writing Ulysses are totally missing the point. And he says that, he conjectures that probably Joyce also depended on Tom's, you know, Dublin directory as much as most of his readers were in order to recreate the world he had lived back in, back in Dublin. Um, he says that, you know, the Marcel in Proust, uh, um, uh, um, uh, what, what is it called? Remembrance, of, Remembrance things past. of things past. Yeah, uh, he said that, you know, it's, uh, Marcel has nothing to do with uh, the Proust. That uh, he un didn't undergo, you know, such a memory, assault of memories when he smelled something. He created it, and literature yeah, has to be seen there as a creation. A, no, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying. That there is a role I that imagination. Do think that of there are there are houses like that, of course. I, I do believe, but um, uh, novel is its own creation. Of course, yeah. of course. Uh, I just ask that because you know you seem to have such a strong grasp over like the social realities of the place that you're writing in. Also, which, this is this is again a patriarchal notion. A lot of lot of women 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 are uh, uh, especially in the rural areas. Yeah, women do tend to work. Yeah. Women do tend to take care of the family. Women actually do work more, more, more work than women, men. Of course. Men, men have men after before work and after work they have all the 14, 15 hours to just idle around. Yeah. Women actually hardly stop working. And when a woman is a working woman, I mean you know it more than I do. <laughs> but yeah, I mean these characters are not so non-existent. Um, women do take care of both husband and children and uh, these husband and children uh, also turn out to be as ungrateful as Nebisuma's children. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what I was leading to was that, you know, so the social landscape of the place that you're writing about, which is very close to your own, you know, home and where, where you live. So, uh, you know, how did that 
sort of you know play into the narrative as well especially what you know what you write about in terms of social media and how whatsapp has has fueled these uh, fuels this you know so you write at one point that uh, you know it's not like these kind of lynchings wouldn't have happened earlier but you know the whole the sheer scale of it so you know what where did uh, i mean how does that sort of uh, where did that narrative thread come from well it uh, obviously it it it, uh, it uh, is strongly grounded in um, a typical kerala village and kerala villages have you know live in such a uh, with, with such mixed life that socially everybody is taking interest in everybody's uh, everybody else's life this is this what happened in this novel may be a negative side of that over you know uh, interest in other people's life but also it uh, it produces remarkable results like uh, for example it's very unlikely that in our area or in uh, places generally in calicut and malappuram that somebody is not receiving treatment with, with uh, because of lack of money people would do that it's very highly unlikely that somebody is living without a house proper house will be built so there is there is an extension of that over you know social interest in everybody else's life also has a tremendous positive effect uh, for example there is this palliative care which is a um, initiative or uh, local initiative now which has spread out now it's driven by volunteers who volunteer themselves to go to houses and take care every second or third day uh, of someone who is you know terminally ill and do his washing or her washing take care of this person uh, give a bath you know provide the essential uh, stuff like you know when my father was sick they brought in uh, the wheelchair they uh, brought in a liftable bed etc yeah so it's i'm only exploring a part of it and uh, kerala is i think um, uh, except for sex sex i mean um, it's the most livable place in the country i think <laughs> yeah yeah so it's deeply grounded in that this this kind of events are also really possible where you know everybody knows everybody else and kerala right. is so there is tremendous interest in what other people are doing and also there is a some amount of like a moral uh, like judgment about uh, kerala's villages are like a proper city it's i mean it's 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 population density is like is unimaginable true? that you 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 just look around everywhere there is houses and everybody knows everybody and also you know the so when you have a village you have a common stadium common football ground common cricket ground all these make you you know quite uh, well aware of one another right uh, so that this novel could have only been possible in a very uh, closely connected community uh, like uh, the communities in kerala yeah and it has nothing another aspect is it has nothing to do with muslims i mean uh, there is no muslim reality about sexual insecurity um it's a proper malayali thing uh, uh, so I, i don't want to yeah also because no uh, when you are engaging in your own community uh, people also expect you to write about you know um the the muslim uh, state state of muslims in india currently i think this is a very false argument so flawed so flawed that it doesn't even have undergarments right um, you know you, you, as a muslim i should not be expected to write about you know the state of muslims in india what are, what are you doing <laughs> you do it kya muslimano kya muslimani ya ke muslimano ko maarne se kisi ko rok de a tum karo apna karo to why do why are you why are you just exporting your lack of conscious unto me is it's not my responsibility um so uh, you know it it's not always it's also very flawed to to expect uh, a dalit to write dalit novels as if you know the, the, uh, uh, ralph ellison a great uh, american novelist he wrote invisible man now later he was asked you know why didn't you write another novel he said ki i i want to write about universal experience but after the reception of the first novel i realized that i'm only expected to write on black experience mm. and i do not consider myself a black writer i consider myself a universal writer writer uh, so for example if don delillo is writing don delillo writes about everybody blacks whites the moment black writer writes or a dalit writer writes it's worthwhile only so far as you know 
they are Dalit or they are... Uh, or if they write about the typical Dalit experience or the typical Muslim experience. Exactly, right? exactly. This is why I said, you know, when you, when you read uh, Virginia Woolf for Iris Murdoch, you see incredibly uh, well-crafted uh, uh, men. I mean, you understand that these, 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 these men are, uh, you know, really men. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, um, yeah. So uh, Virginia Woolf and Iris Murdoch are not sitting down and writing. Chalo, I, I wrote about a woman in the last novel. Now let me write about another woman, another female aspect of a perspective in this novel. This is not really how it works. It works. Um, so yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, and I wish we had time to more time to go into this because you say a lot of things about identity without really like seeing seeing it. But uh, in the sense that also what I what I realize is what you're saying is that the the opposite is also maybe true that you shouldn't only have to uh, write about your own experience and. Can anybody write about a Dalit? Yeah, there's a incident? problem with problem with writing one's own experiences again. You know, it harkens back to the same question that I earlier asked. How much you have the capacity? Does a, does a human being has a capacity to speak outright truth about himself or herself? My understanding that it is not. And since it is not, it is the question of authenticity would also become a filtered event where you know you have to focus on a certain aspect of you, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. Yeah, so, uh, so what qualifies for a memoir shouldn't uh, be, you know, masqueraded as a fiction, because fiction, in fiction you have to tell the truth. Right. In memoir, it's, you know, you can still make a space for some lies. Uh, fiction is truth, hardcore truth. <laughs> That's definitely a very refreshing perspective. Uh, do we have any questions? Hi, congratulations on the brilliant debut. I mean, it's hard to believe that it's your first uh, novel, though it's really interesting to hear that you've written three before. Two and a half. But yeah, <laughs> okay. that's why I tell myself that <laughs> when, when Ajita says I'm a debutant, I say that no, I, I own up my previous failed novels also. <laughs> <laughs> So refreshing to hear knowledge. that. <laughs> um, but uh, two questions. One, uh, you know, what we began with about uh, the Malayali's insecurity with other people having sex. Do you think that's more the Malayali male's insecurity? And second, uh, I know this is, as you emphasized, it's, uh, it's not inspired by any particular incident, but the two issues that. Um, But the truth is that uh, these mob lynchings have been happening over the years. Uh, the person who was lynched, I mean, that the most recent case was that of a worker from Arunachal Pradesh. So to what extent do you think caste and class also plays a role in that uh, uh, Burhan is, uh, is not wealthy, right? He's, do, do you think if he was a more affluent person, it wouldn't have... Um, turned out this way? Well, uh, affluence doesn't stay in a uh, village. The moment you're affluent, you go away from village. So, and secondly, I think uh, in Kerala, it's still possible whether you are uh, financially rich or not. So, Rehana in this, in this novel is rich. Yeah, she's not, she's not, um, she's not not rich. She's pretty rich. First question, I'm not a doctor of uh, Malayali sexual insecurities. <laughs> But I largely assume that, you know, when um, sex only happens through marriage, well, Malayalis marry at 23, 24. Why? Because they want to have sex. They cannot have sex without marriage. And they don't know how to have sex. So the, within the very first year of marriage, they are parents also. Now the rest of their life, they are, you know, taking care of the uh, children. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a far general point that, you know, if I'm um, going to a hotel, uh, the hotel I am staying now, specifically, says that, you know, do ko mat Ye pata hai sabko ki matlab the hotel is also afraid that, you know, somebody is going to have sex in their uh, hotel room without, you know, proper marriage certificate. Um, so, sex by marriage certificate is the notion uh, all over India. Uh, Malayali, Malayali is just a reflection of the, the overall trend that is in India. Sex is accessible in India only through marriage. 
and uh, it's not as if you know those who are not married are not having sex but still it's uh, uh, limited to the cities largely indians are virgins if you aren't if you if you aren't married at the age of 40 you are a 40, 40 year old virgin this is the truth in 90% of the times yeah so it's a natural consequence of that and the fun fact is that most of those perpetrators themselves you know are frustrated by the fact that they are not getting enough sex right and it's it's not like that i mean most of the time this this again you know uh, goes back to the same thing that i believe that human beings are deeply fake that i can only appreciate if somebody tells me that you know, somebody before me tells me about you know her caste crusade or uh, crusade against you know race crusade against class oppression crusade against what whatever you want to call i realize that there is an aspiration in me or the other person who is offering this critique there is nothing beyond aspiration largely uh, in delhi i was speaking and in delhi i was saying that you know you the, these listeners who were listening to me i asked them how many of you have dark boyfriends or girlfriends and not only at the time i told them to go back you go back you dated 10 men 10 women how many of them were dark skinned how many of them were obeses how many of them were scs how many of them were sts none i don't know it's not scientifically possible to know but i imagine that you know from the lives i live from the life i live i imagine that largely their aesthetics is a f aesthetics of fairness in jnu everybody every woman female friend not sushmita but <laughs> other female friends har wak bolte the nawazuddin siddiqui man nawazuddin siddiqui man it's so so untrue that you nawazuddin siddiqui you know looks like the most normal indian that nawazuddin siddiqui if you as a auto driver you wouldn't say these things you wouldn't say these things but a fair man with a blue eye making a tea in pakistan would become an overnight sensation because it is fairness and any any rebellion that you that you that rebel uh, that you are you claiming to be is not actually a rebellion until your aesthetic prejudices are attended to and resolved because aesthetics is what governs uh, most of our scheme of things including caste this is my understanding that uh, we don't often uh, say this jab main shaadi karne jaate kya karte hain look if you talk to a you know marriage broker in india all our social scientists would have to just sit back home because marriage brokers exactly know the the state of our progressive uh, credentials bolenge ye kali hai ye thoda brown hai bolenge she is irava they would say it very clearly this is dalit they would say it right so you don't have to prove your progressiveness by you know um, uh, attributing great sexiness to nawazuddin siddiqui you're just saying it for the sake of saying it i mean i don't say that uh, i don't say that you know nawazuddin siddiqui is not handsome that's not what i mean but this performative uh, righteousness no that really triggers uh, in me you know some kind of uh, disbelief in the person who is you know uh, performing this we are all flawed and that uh, that understanding that i am flawed is the beginning of uh, uh, you know any serious self reflection i i tell that i t i was sitting with sushmita i was i was telling her that i dated two women both of them were fair and i am dark is there a problem with me there is a problem with me uh, it's not i mean both of both times they proposed me but you know still i mean i i was hanging around them right <laughs> so we all know how to you know be somebody else that we are you know somebody else yeah somebody other than you know what we are projecting as i sense a great essay in that what you said about you know the politics of aesthetic pleasure what we take pleasure in aesthetically i think there's a there's a great uh, great idea there I tell my And students all this now when when a movie taking place आइटम नंबर आइटम सॉन्ग में आते हैं पता नहीं ये कोई ये कैरेक्टर दिस कैरेक्टर वुडन बी इन दैट मूवी सडनली देर इज यू नो गर्ल ड्रॉप्स फ्रॉम द स्काईज एंड शी बिगिन्स डांसिंग एंड मैन ऑल्सो इट्स अ ग्रेट इवेंट इन ऑल मूवीज इन मलयालम मूवी एंड तमिल मूवी दिस आर द टू मूवीज द टू लैंग्वेजेस आई अटेंड टू 
what, what if that woman, it's a woman basically, कोई धोती पहन के कोई बंदा उधर से ऊपर से उतरा तो इतना sensational नहीं होगा वो. But suppose that that woman is utterly dark. That item dance uh, song में जो नाच रही है, she is utterly dark. Would dark men would go and watch it? It's a, it's a question. It's it's very easy. It's uh, this is my understanding about you know. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to write novels. I'm trying to write emotionally charged lives, tales, etc. And this is my understanding that it's nearly impossible, and I mean it, nearly impossible to shed your privileges to a complete zero. It's not going to happen. What you what can happen is a very serious, non-preachy self-reflection. And that's exactly why I said if people are writing novels about their own experience, the simple question is, how much are you not telling about you? And we know this. We know this. Even between husband and wife, they are living uh, their whole life together, 30, 40 years. How much do you know about both of you? How much aren't you talking about each other? It's, so, yeah, there is a fundamental weakness in human beings that it cannot be honest beyond a point. And the fact that it cannot be honest beyond a point um, must make us rely on fiction. Because <laughs> these are at least imagined truths. No, I love what you said about how fiction is the truth telling. You know, fiction is about telling truths. You can even lie in your memoir, but in fiction, you must tell truths. I think that's that's a great uh, point to keep in mind um, and uh, close the session on. And Saru is here. His books are also available. Please uh, buy the book, uh, read the book, talk to Saru. He's around. Thanks. Thank you, so much. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>